Well, welcome back everyone to the show. She Knows with your host, Brandon Burns. I'm excited for today's guest. I've got a professor, a suicide prevention expert and mental health advocate. She's a board member at the NDIA. She's chief strategy officer at Together AI. She's the chair at Swiss 8, chair at Street, which is aiming to stop youth homelessness. She is a strategic advisor at Clarity Workplace Solutions, and she's a proud mother of three. She's also a part-time marathon runner. I'd like to welcome to the show, Jane Burns. How are you? I'm very well, Brandon. How are you? Pretty good. Hey, where'd you get that last name? It's a ripper. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a good old Burns. <laughs> <laughs> now, was your nickname in school the same as mine? Was it Burnsy? No, well, it's actually not my, uh, it's my married name. <laughs> oh, there we go. What was the maiden? Mudge. Mudge, I love that. Mudgy. Mudgy, there we go. All right, well, there's there's the bite already. We've got our highlight post already. Mudgy, you know, Mudgy says. Yeah, Um, Mudgy it was. Now, you're obviously similar to me. We're locked down in in Melbourne, Victoria here. But one of the first questions I love to throw at my guest is, you know, what does a typical day in the life of Jane Burns look like? And obviously I'd love to hear from you about, you know, maybe what it, was or is going to be post lockdown and what it's kind of been during yes so my typical day pre-lockdown was I'd probably be flying to Sydney once or twice a week uh, maybe to Canberra uh, at board meetings um, doing strategy work with some of the startup companies that I'm supporting Uh, it was pretty busy um, lots of travel um, and then back home with family on the weekends now with lockdown, and what are we up to? Day 255,000 million or something like that. Um, it is literally up into the office, start the day, get out and try and do some exercise, uh, try to do something with the kids, and and that's about it. And a lot of Zoom calls, which has um, it's been interesting. You know, I've seen teams build where people have literally not met each other. Um, and last year I did a, a capital raise for this well and productive CRC bid of you know 41 and a half million dollars uh without having met people it was insane oh hang on just give me that amount again how much did you raise in lockdown well last year was 41.3 this year is 43.5 million cash cash in the bank congratulations not in the um, bank yet not in the bank yet <laughs> Yeah, tell me, right? Um, That's a really good point. So it's a massive amount and it kind of dispels the myth that, um, you know, investment needs to be an eyeball discussion and face-to-face. You know, it it can be uh, better or easier for certain things, I'm guessing, but what's been that one key insight or hack that you implemented that allowed you to actually successfully do it whilst being bound by virtual Look, it's, it's a great question. I think it was really authentic engagement. So, and I'll use the example of the Digital Health Organisation guys. I hadn't met them. Um, they came in as an introduction from one of the ministers. Um, we got on a call and we started doing a weekly Zoom call. And we just started really talking about life and the challenges of life and, and what it all meant. And what they were trying to achieve was a virtual reality goggle um, that measures concussion. And it just seemed so cool and interesting. And we brought them into the CRC bid um, last year and this year again. Um, And then when I met them, you sort of, you meet people and you expect them to be a certain way. And we developed such a rapport online. And when I met them, they were exactly as I expected them to be, which is usually doesn't happen that way. And you know, I'd, I still speak to Ben um, Parsons probably once once a week and we check in on each other and we check in on, you know, we've both got kids and but we're both passionate about making a real difference in people's lives. So I think if you can authentically connect and have those conversations, I'd much rather do it face-to-face, but it can be done via, you know, on camera. Wow. So... Talk me through, right, you mentioned that you, you catch up with um, certain stakeholders across your interest, you know, once a week. I'm sure there's others you do daily, some monthly. You, you're currently a chair and on the board of two or three different organisations. You've got multiple um, ventures underway. Talk me through what maybe not just a typical day but a typical week might look like for how you spread your time 
and what those ventures are. Yeah, so I, I should have said I'm no longer the chair of Street. So I did four years with Street and finished up um, in uh, July of this year. Um, incredible organisation doing amazing work with very vulnerable young people and probably one of my favourite social enterprises. Uh, but my week would, and I'm, I'm pretty flexible, which can work um, for some people, may not work so well for others. So I like to pick up the phone and I like people to pick up the phone and to have a chat with me, particularly when something's, um, you know, when they want to check in on something. I'm not great on email. So my typical week would be I'll have a catch up with Together AI guys on a Monday morning and a Wednesday. We do a stand up. Um, you know, it's a brand new startup. Um, just done their capital raise. The team's phenomenal. Um, and Josh, their leader, makes it a point that, you know, we actually need to work on connecting and staying connected. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I'll connect with others like um, uh, Swiss 8 and Adrian um, just randomly. We'll pick up the phone and have a chat to each other or we'll send each other a text. Uh, with a kin, Liesl Yearsley, um, her technology around artificial intelligence, I think, is going to be just groundbreaking. I think it'll be a real game changer for people who live with a disability. Um, we have less formal, more informal. Um, so text, check-ins, catch-ups. Um, another great one, Total Brain, Simon Poitivan. Um, you might know rugby um, ex-Wallaby guy. You know, we'll just do a, a quick check-in check, check -in phone call. So it varies. Um, some of it's structured around workshops. Um, you know, the Clarity, um, Clarity guys um, who are whistleblowers will do sort of more of a formal structure. Um, and then obviously when you're trying to progress things, you actually do need to jump on calls together and work together. Um, and what you would normally do as a co-design workshop, you just simply can't do face-to-face. -face. So we've had a few interesting, interesting co-design workshops. They don't work as well on Zoom as they do face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Now, one, one I want to ask you about is you're on the board of the NDIA, which is, that's huge. And I want to ask you, how did that come about? And talk me through the passion and the, and the why around why you're doing that yeah sure so um well it's dear to my heart so I have a 15 year old who lives with quite a severe disability so Angus is my eldest he has down syndrome autism and is non-verbal so he got the triple whammy ah. um I got him onto the NDIS when it first um was open to participants here in Melbourne mm -hmm. and it has been it's changed our lives because we immediately have that access and support and care and we can choose who we want to use. So I use Hire Up and All for Smiles Ability, which are two newcomers to the market. Um, the Hire Up guys, I just take my hat off to them. They've done a phenomenal job. Um, so being on the board, you know, you're sort of talking about half a million people, all with very different needs. And it is probably one of the greatest infrastructures, in my view, that Australia has invested in. Um, and I think it should be bipartisan. It should be both, uh, you know, apolitical, frankly. And what's been achieved in the seven years, and it's not perfect, and, you know, as a board member sitting on a board, you don't have control of day-to-day -day operations. You don't have control of, you know, what's happening in each state and territory. That's the job of the executive. Mm -hmm. um, but they are trying to solve some of the biggest issues that no country anywhere in the world has ever solved. Um, and that is how to ensure that you put the scaffolding and the support around our most vulnerable, those people who live with disability. So when I was asked to join, um, you know, you, you do a lot of homework on these things. I'd been chair and still I'm chair of Open Arms, which is the Veterans Families Counselling Service. And the previous minister had moved across to become disability minister. And I'd worked you know, for a little while with him. Um, and so he knew of, you know, the types of approaches that I took. And I'm a big fan of lived experience shaping services. Um, and so I was appointed um, for that reason. Um, so that said, it's all been during lockdown. So it's really hard to be on a board that has such responsibility and so much complexity and really feel that you're actually doing it justice and I think that's the biggest challenge with any board position. You don't want to be on a board if you're there as a token and you don't want to be on a board if you don't feel that you can have voice and 
you certainly don't want to be on a board where you're interfering with the executive and, and not allowing them to get on and do what they are exceptionally good at. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting, challenging, but incredible system if we get it right. Um, and I think, you know, certainly the impact on Angus, the impact on friends that I know who use the NDIS has been profound. Brilliant. I'm impressed. <laughs> this is excellent. I don't know how you find the time because, you know, being a proud mother of three as well and now describing your circumstances, um, you know, maybe this is an important question to ask you as, as a woman and a mum and, and doing everything you're doing. What's your support network look like and who do you turn to to really be able to perform at that high level? Again, I think... Um... <laughs> I'm not perfect, so I don't get it right all the time. Or, you know, you get some things right and you get some things so profoundly wrong that you sort of look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, wow, how did I not see that? Um, but I went to an Australian Institute of Companies Directors breakfast and I don't remember who was speaking, um, but I remember them saying, whatever you do, buy in the services and the supports that you can. And you can't do it all alone. That's the reality of it. So... From a, you know, I had three kids under five. Um, we had a nanny and I didn't feel bad about that. I didn't feel anything about that. I just felt that to do justice to my kids and to do justice to my career, I needed some support and help. Um, you know, I've got a, a supportive partner. Um, he took a step back from his work so that I could continue doing what I was doing when we set up the Young and Well CRC. I mean, that was, I'd never, I've never been a CEO before. I'd never you know, I had no clue as to what a cooperative research centre was and suddenly I ended up with this, you know, $40 million investment to get 75 partners to work together around digital technologies. Um, and this is back in 2009-10. So I've always been a big fan of ask for help, lean on your family. My mum and dad are incredible and, you know, sort of lockdown's been tough because I haven't been able to see them as many, many, many families um, are in the same boat. Um, friends have been fantastic. Um, you know, you just, and I have the most incredible network of um, peers, both men and women, uh, who I just pick up the phone and have a chat to. Um, and, I, I, you know, sort of Dawn O'Neill in particular um, springs to mind. She was the CEO of Lifeline and Beyond Blue. Uh, you know, where we just pick up the phone and I say, oh, I just marked it up. What do you reckon, Dawn? And she'll, she'll, she's like a wise Obi, one Kenobi, um, and we'll talk it through. And, and Jan Owen was the same, you know, when she was on the board of um, Reach Out and then she was the CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians. They were my two go-to women. Um, Helen Herman, who's gone on to, to be the chair of the World Psychiatric Association. Again, incredible sounding board. And you just reach out to and continue to learn from those people that you you know that that are your mentors and your peers and I think increasingly now as I get more experience and and um, start to move into a different trajectory and career I'm learning a massive amount from younger people who are coming through and sort of looking at them and, and knowing that I'm supporting them but also just learning a heap of stuff yeah um Amazing. Um, what I took from that mainly is ask for help, you know, and um, you also talked about your mum and dad. The next question I had for you was to hear a little bit more about who your role models were growing up and also how that shaped the type of role model you are or you are aspiring to be. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, country South Australia in a city called Port Pirie. It's claim to fame is it's the largest lead smelter in the Southern Hemisphere. So it'd be fair to say I wasn't exposed to many global thought leaders, uh, but my two probably most profound influences in my life at that time uh, were my nana and mum. And so nana had mum when she was 17, mum had me when she was 21. So we were this close-knit, you know, mum was an only child family and my nana was quite possibly one of the most kind, generous, thoughtful. She taught me everything about, you know, save the seals and guide dogs for the blind. And so I was this, you know, this young girl growing up in Port Pirie who was just passionate about social issues before social issues became social issues. So um, it was, you know, it was, it was an interesting time, you know, as an industrial working class kid, really. 
um, in an industrial working class town, um, growing up and sort of trying to determine well, who am I and what do I want to do with life. But they were the two most profound influences. And I went to a Catholic school, so I'd have to say the nuns had a profound influence on, you know, you know, you sort of you look back and you think all of that um, very strict upbringing of Catholic and doom and gloom and um, but also a fair chunk of values in there as well, you know, sort of about how you live a good life and, and giving back to society. So that, that's probably the, the main influences in my early years. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Um, how far away from the middle of, I guess, Adelaide CBD would, would that um, be? <laughs> it's three hours north. Oh, okay. So it's at the base of the Flinders Ranges and, uh, as you drive, you drive through Port Wakefield, then Snowtown, then Red Hill, then Crystal Brook, and you come up through and across the highway. And the first thing you see is this massive stack, which is a lead smelter stack. And then you see the Flinders Ranges. And so you've got this, the Flinders Ranges, and then this lead smelting town. Beautiful. Love it. Um, hope you can get back sometime soon, hey? Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Now tell me, um, you've been the CEO, you've been the chair of a board, you've been the entry level graduate, um, you've worked for people, you've had people work for you. Um, have you experienced along the journey any specific kind of, you know, gender challenges that um, have been both maybe a bit of a jarring experience, but also a really good learning and opportunity to impact change yourself? Look, I, I started in, you know, I did a PhD in medicine. So my first role was at the Royal Children's Hospital here in, uh, in Melbourne. And at the time, I don't think you realise how challenging and difficult it is as a female coming up through the ranks. And I remember I'd just come out of doing the PhD um, and we had an incredible leader in Bob Williamson who supported both men and women coming through. And someone said to me, oh, you only, you only uh, get airtime with Bob because you're tall and you've got blonde hair. <laughs> I was like, what on earth are you? Like, I was really shocked. I was really like, wow. And then I looked at it and I thought, well, that's not true because he catches up with Craig Olson as well, who was another peer and colleague. So it's sort of those jarring moments where you think, okay, that's a really interesting thing to have you know, to, to have said or to even to think. And then as you sort of go through, and I've done a lot of work, obviously um, I've had chairs who have been politicians and it's just a different way of working. Um, certainly watching, you know, the conversations that have come out from Julie Bishop and uh, Julia Gillard and um, politicians who've come through as female politicians, when you listen to that podcast, it, it is pretty profound. You sort of go, yep, I've experienced all of those things all of those things as a female coming through. But at the time, you work out how you actually navigate through it. Um, and now you see people calling it out more and more. But we were of a generation where we did not, absolutely did not call it out because it was career limiting. And mm -hmm. I'm finding it really, really interesting to watch um, and to see how brave not just women are, but younger generation of men are and actually calling out poor behavior and yep, yep. I think that's hard it's tough it's not that's not an easy thing to do and it's it is and can be career limiting and I think that would be my reflection if there's anything that we can do as generations coming through it's to support people to speak out and to speak out openly and honestly about when they see it when they see discrimination when they see sexual harassment when they see poor behavior and you see it in every walk of life. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the not-for-profit sector, if you're in big industry, if you're in university land, you see poor behaviour. And I think it's a challenge. Yeah. So there's an element of calling it out and sort of, um, you know, pulling it up. Um, what about the next step, which is, you know, it's harder, but trying to get some education happening or people that have maybe exhibited it to, you know, be rid of it. Well, look, and it's why I've it's why I've done the cap raise for this well and productive CRC. The whole focus of that CRC is on psychological safety in the workplace. Um, it's why I've joined Clarity Workplace Solutions. It's 
it's why I think the Together AI technologies are, are around having conversations and what those safe conversations look like. I just think if we don't start to do something about it, we are going to end up with a very, very unwell society. And we're already seeing that in our uh, psychological workplace and safety claims. Um, you know, they're on the rise. Um, it's all to do with relationships and the way people treat each other. Um, and, and that might be due to the way the work's structured. It might be due, due to the pressures that people are under. Um, you know, you sort of look at some of the workforces that are under extreme duress at the moment. So, you know, our defence first responders, um, healthcare workers, you know, even people in the you know, um, supermarket, you know, sort of customer, you know, that, that anger and that vitriol and the just the challenges that they're facing um, are tough. So I think as a society, we've got a real opportunity to reset the bar on how we look after each other, how kind we can be to each other, how, you know, I, people talk about gratitude, but actually how we acknowledge our gratitude and what it means to actually live in this world and have the capacity to do amazing things in this world and to acknowledge that we don't always get it right. <laughs> Yeah, you made a really good point there about how there is a real heightened sense of uh, anger and um, unhappiness, which we can't really blame one person for, but we're all feeling. And I wholeheartedly agree because I've both witnessed it. And at times I'll put my hand up and say, I've been, um, you know, not the, not, not the best with my behaviour when I've interacted with, say, a person at the supermarket or someone in a retail setting or someone like, you know, um, those first responders you talked about who'd be handling a lot of it. Um, given that we can't really do a lot about it, I mean, we can control ourselves. There's a lot we can't control. What's something key you'd recommend from your professional experience that we could do that could maybe help us give others a bit of a chop out when they're on the receiving end unfairly? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a $50 million question, but I think... There's a lot to be said for taking a deep breath and walking away from a situation that's, that's making you feel angry. And no one in this world is perfect. So there is no one who has it right 100% of the time. And I've been like you, you know, you sort of get to, this, to a stage where you're just so frustrated or you're so annoyed by something that you you do lash out or you do say something that's not particularly pleasant. I think the brave person is someone who can pick up the, the phone and, and apologise or, you know, sort of take a step back and say, actually, I made a mistake um, or look at themselves and say, actually, that was poor behaviour and next time I'm going to work hard to not act like that. So I think that's at an individual level. I think then at a, at a collective responsibility level, actually calling out poor behaviour when you see it in other people, you know, and, and being brave enough to do that, you know, you didn't respond particularly well to X, Y, Z, or that tone meant blah, blah, blah. And I think they're the challenges that we've got as communities um, to think about, because you see it not just in workplaces, you see it on the footy field when the kids were able to play footy, but, you know, you'd see someone irate and you'd be thinking, well, hang on a minute, <laughs> they're, 10 <laughs> like why are you so angry um and it's not it, it it's not just it's everywhere it's everywhere people are you know you see it on twitter and i look at people just going off on twitter and you think this is a person a human being who's trying to do their very best at their job um yeah they're not always going to get it right but at least they're showing up and at least they're turning up and at least they're trying to do the best they possibly can yep yeah Love it. Um, we don't have the answer, but you're right. Like, um, I love the fact that you've alluded to being able to call out behaviour there and get better and better at refining how to do it in a really diff um, diffusing manner because it's so hard not to be emotive and heightened in those situations. Um, and But we all need to be able to have a better discussion about it and get on with our groceries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're now putting each other's hair out for the toilet paper. <laughs> Correct. Well, you were one of those. I get it. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> hey, you know, whatever it takes. Um, I'm a big fan of the four ply. You know, there is a difference. Um, so I want to ask you because we've kind of we kind of covered it off a bit. 
But let's let's do a bit of a deep dive back to when you were maybe starting out your career. And, you know, now that you've experienced this breadth of career, which has had the highs and the lows and variety in particular, what are maybe some key things, one or two, that you'd love to be able to change because you just know in your heart that if that happened, it would expedite um, the career or the trajectory for others in your footsteps now? You know, so how could you, what are some things that are just clear, blatant changes you'd make in a heartbeat that would really make a difference to speed things up and make it not easier, but more um, frictionless for others? Yeah. Um, I, I think the big one is acceptance of diversity. Uh, so, you know, I, I think proactively realising that there's no diversity in this mix and by diversity it's not just gender and, and sexual um, preference, it's that neurodiversity, that different way of thinking. So I've been really, um, I suppose, interested in and fascinated in watching the neurodiverse workforce come to the fore and the, the guys from With You With Me, I think uh, they, they will change the way workplaces think about how to include people um, who are diverse thinkers mm -hmm. and what does it actually look like to include those people but not just include them from a tokenistic point of view but from a this is how we really get neurodiverse thinking happening and I think People will play a major role in that, but so too will technologies, um, mm -hmm. enabling people to have voice where they've never, ever, ever had voice before. And I, you know, I did a bit of it with Young and Well, where we were we proactively engaged with young people who probably wouldn't have normally engaged as, as you know, brains trust or as, um, you know, as young people with voice, but we really positioned it to make sure that they had that voice and. Again, it was probably 10 years too late. So, you know, <laughs> when I was starting off, you just don't know what you don't know. And I think that's the real challenge. So I think the neurodiversity one is a big one. I still don't think we've done anywhere near enough around giving people comfort in being able to talk about mental illness and what that means in terms of how they engage with other people um, whether that's in a workplace or whether that's in community and I think there's a lot of work still to do on that but they're probably the two biggies um, so diversity of workforce and greater acceptance of diverse people within a workforce mm, yeah um, okay I, I think that's I'm sold let me know off air how I can help with that one um, tell me about Together AI, because um, you're the chief strategy officer there, which is a big post because in many ways that says to the market that you're the person who's kind of helping steer the ship but not getting in the way, but being able to have a bit of um, instinct about, you know, this, this bigger term vision for that business. What's the key problem that it's solving and what's that unique way that it's going to do it? So Together AI... And the big problem it's solving is how do we help people have better conversations in families? And how do you have that right conversation at the right time and get to a solution that enables better family cohesion effectively, which then has knock on effects for the mental health and the well being of families, but also the children within those families? So I joined because I think the technologies are right and I think you can now achieve that when we tried to do it back in 2011 um, we did it through a living lab model of sitting adults and children together so that they could have a conversation about how they were engaging with technologies and it was all about cyber safety back then um, and it was important they were really important conversations because they were you know, you can imagine back then technology wasn't like what it is today. Um, you know, we thought mobile apps were the most incredible things since sliced bread. And all of a sudden there were, you know, thousands of the things. So what we were trying to achieve in those original studies was to sort of understand how you can support families to have those conversations and how you support those families to have conversations earlier before children and young people got into trouble. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to... Uh, the beginning of this year when Josh Wilson, who's the CEO and founder, found me on LinkedIn and I thought, who is this weird, <laughs> who is this weird person? I don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to have a chat, but I'm not sure that I'm your person. 
And I got on a call with Josh like this and had the conversation and he talked me through really authentically what he had done, which was made a massive mistake and why he wanted to get this company up and running. And so I was really sold on that, but I wanted to do my due diligence. Um, and I spoke to his chairperson um, and she had been his mentor for many, many, many years. And she said, this is probably one of the, the you know, defining moments for Josh because it, it taught him humility. And I then met him face to face and I was immediately blown away by his authenticity, his desire to help people his ability to bring together incredible teams and the fact that I think the technology is now ready um, to take us to that next level. And also because I think there is so much content out there that for parents trying to navigate, and you've got four kids under eight, it's it's a minefield and it's a real challenge. And knowing not to knowing how to or where to find that information, let alone how to use that information. Mm -hmm. is I think one of our biggest, biggest issues. And I certainly feel that as a mother to three kids. But when I talk to friends who also have children, knowing when and how to have conversations about prickly things from pornography to suicide is really tough. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sold again. Um, together, I also like, oh, how do people find that? Is, it, um, is there a website or...? So at the moment, it's a beta community and um, there's 20,000 families within that community already. Um, and this is, again, what I love about the way in which they're structuring it. So the team that he's built out and again, you know, I've joined as chief strategy officer, but um, risk is a big issue. Um, and so the chief risk officer, chief financial officers, you know, it, it's structured in the right way. So it's a beta community. You can find it on um, just google together ai and you can join the beta community um but i think you know internationally i think it's going to be a major uh, winner love it tell me um i just want to take a quick detour and ask you is there like one amazing woman whether it's in australia or, or globally that's doing something like awesome that's caught your attention recently which you maybe weren't aware of that you're like oh wow that's so cool oh one <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, Lisa Yearsley is just phenomenal. Her, again, she's artificial intelligence um, and was doing AI before AI was cool. So I met Lisa when we were trying to do uh, reach outs uh, online um, avatar bus. I can't even remember what it was called back then. And she was a technologist who was supporting Jack Keith at the time. And we, we suddenly joined the dots and that was about 2008 and I saw her talk at a conference on the role of artificial intelligence and what it would mean for healthcare professionals and she then went back into fintech so she didn't pursue that um, young people or health aspect and then we reconnected again through another amazing woman Anne Marie Elias and um, I, again I think she's had four startups um, this is her fourth and she's looking at using the technology for support of people with disability. And she's also got a beta community going, um, looking at how you might create this tech that actually supports people man managing their own um, support workers through the NDIS. So I think that one's incredible. Um, I've reconnected with my US colleague, Scotty Cash, who's from Ohio State. She's incredible. Um, some of the tech coming out of the US is phenomenal. Um, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff happening. Love it. Now, tell me, um, this could be the weirdest, wackiest thing. It could be boring. Everyone does it. It could be something unique. But, like, what are some of those key secrets to success? So whether you're thinking um, back to your daily routine or whether it's something you've implemented to make you, like, ten times more efficient with your time, um, hit us with some of those, those secrets that have really served you so well. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if there's anything too weird or wacky about it, but um, running has been my uh, think time, de-stress time, mindfulness time. I'd say probably that has been my constant. So I started running in 99, I think it was, um, and really got madly into exercise when I was doing my PhD. Um, 
so getting that balance of physical fitness and mental fitness, I think is, is really important. Um, I love downtime with the kids. So everything from music to mountain bike riding of which I went mountain bike riding on Sunday in the rain with Harry and fell in a big mud puddle. And um, <laughs> just looking at myself going, what are you doing? <laughs> That's the photo that needs to go on LinkedIn. You have you have pink runners that are now covered in stinking mud. But I think all of those things that give you a reality check. Um, and, I, 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 you know, I also love just hanging out with my girlfriends and just, you know, having a chat about just the day-to-day -day stuff um, that, you know, is a challenge. I mean, nothing's... Life is messy. I think that's the reality of it. Life is messy. It's tough. It's hard. There are ups, there are downs. No one's perfect. No family is perfect. No job is perfect. Um, although I'm filling the together hour, one is actually pretty close to it. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's. I, I think it's all of those things. It's just sort of taking it back and just sort of going, okay, what do I need to do to just get through this day? And how do I get through this day? Love it. What's the biggest fear or biggest fears? It's always failure. You're always terrified of failure. But um, as I've learned over the many years of experience, failure actually breeds success. So, and that's a, a cliche, but through all the failures and all the mistakes, um, it, it gives you more insight into, well, what's next? And I think generosity and sharing that knowledge is absolutely fundamental. Um, I love the fact that, you know, I'm mentoring a lot of young people coming through uh, the ranks, both male and female. Um, yeah, I think continue to be curious is super, super, super important. Um, I think it's easy to get stuck in a routine or stuck in a rut or stuck in a way of thinking. So as I mentioned earlier, I just feel like I'm learning so much from, from the younger guys coming through. <laughs> and, um, and probably more, I'm probably learning more from them than they're learning from me. So um, I think, you know, all of those things are, are important ingredients to, to just sort of quelling your fears. Yeah, love it. Excellent. Um, is there a secret talent that maybe, well, not no one knows about, but only a select few <laughs> do that you're willing to share on the show? Could it be karaoke? Could it be crocheting or knitting or you know, what? <laughs> give, us, give us some goss. What's the secret talent? Oh, I don't know that it's so much of a secret talent, but I do love my Zumba class. <laughs> yeah. I love Another it. video that should be on LinkedIn. We need to humanise our guests. Oh, no. Oh, no. And I do, I do love a good dance, that's for sure. But uh, anyone who's seen me would say I've got two left feet. <laughs> <laughs> Zumba is still a thing, yeah? Is it still a, a worldwide craze and a, yeah? To me, it, so I go to the local YMCA. I think that is the most incredible environment. I've been to Zumba classes with young, young, young people, older people, people with Down syndrome, um, an older guy who'd be probably in his 70s, 80s. Um, it, it's, the music's amazing. Just the atmosphere's fantastic. You cannot do Zumba without smiling. Like you just can't. It's impossible. And the energy is just frenetic. You just leave with this, you know, it's hard work because I'm hopeless and I can't follow the steps very well, but um, you just leave with this sense of that is joy on legs. <laughs> awesome. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to hold you to a part two potentially even a part three. I reckon we just do this regularly. It's uh, awesome. Time's flown, but I want to ask you before we wrap up and give you the opportunity to share with our audience, how can we collaborate with you? How can we get in touch? How can we get involved? Look, reach out on LinkedIn. Um, that's always easy. Um, the Well and Productive CRC is, it's a collaboration. So if you're interested in being a part of something that looks after the psychological safety of of people's help then please feel free to give me a bell and and join um, but i like i like connecting with people um, that's probably my superhuman power uh, and i like connecting like-minded people uh, because i do think 
And the guys will laugh when I say this, together we do better. <laughs> I don't think one person can do it alone. I don't think one organisation has the answer. I don't think one technology is going to solve the problems of the world. Um, and I do think we have to think collectively, what is it that we can actually do that makes the world a better place? Jane Burns, superstar. What a jam-packed episode. And thank you for your time. We can't wait to do this uh, in person, give you a tour of our new studio. And uh, maybe that's where we do part two, hey? Yep, absolutely. Without a doubt. And let's get those super, super women together. <laughs> thank you, Jane.